All right, Hebrews chapter 12. Let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll uh, get stuck in. Father, we, uh, we pray that as we come to your word again today, Lord, that you would uh, richly bless our time, that you would enable us to, to see the truth of your word, that the word would impact us, that your spirit would convict us, that we would, Lord, be spoken to by you through your word this day. And Lord, change us. May we be impacted by your word that we might not be the same. That you might intervene again in our lives and you might continually be renewing our minds and molding us and changing us that we might be more like your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, Hebrews chapter 12. We are only going to be covering the first couple of verses this morning, which is a great relief to me because I forgot my glasses. <laughs> so I haven't got too much text to read. Um, so chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which in clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's a very well-known passage of scripture. It's one that, like most well-known passages of scripture, uh, has degrees of misunderstanding that goes along with it. But uh, we start off with the word therefore. And obviously here the reference to the cloud of witnesses is such that we understand that everything that's being said here is on the basis of this great chapter of faith that we took so long over. We went through these journeys of these great people of faith and we again and again saw, um, as we sung this morning actually, that their lives proved his faithfulness. The story of Hebrews 11 is not that Abraham was a man of great faithfulness. A cursory reading of Genesis would enable us to understand that Abraham, for much of his life, for most of his life, was not a man of great faithfulness. That he was a man of compromised faith, a man who messed up and did amazing things and then messed up and then did amazing things. And that God proved his faithfulness to these people because he took that faith and he matured it. And so Abraham finally came to that place when having doubted Isaac's birth, having doubted the ability of Sarah to give birth, he finally gets to the place of faith where he believes that if he kills his son, that God would raise him from the dead before he would neglect his covenant. The faith of us is accomplished through recognizing the faithfulness of him. When we understand that he will not stumble, that he will not fail, that he will not let go of any of his promises, then we become people of faith as we learn to trust him. And the therefore here at the start of chapter 12 is telling us very clearly it is because of all that we've seen and that we've learned. These people who believed that God was going to fulfill his promises even if it was done in the next life. That is what the, uh, the listeners to this sermon, to this book, were being encouraged to do. So therefore, he says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, this is the bit that I think people are familiar with, and I think there's some misunderstanding here. Um, on the one hand, Paul is... Uh, sorry, Paul. The writer of the Hebrews here, who I don't think is Paul, the writer of the Hebrews here is, um, is using uh, a, certainly an athletic analogy. He talks about running with endurance the race set before us. And I think that sometimes we look at that and then we picture this cloud of witnesses being, uh, being this, this 
mass of saints surrounding us in the stadium. So here we are, we come in the stadium, and here we are, we're running our race, and they're all there sort of, you know, with their uh, popcorn and their, their flags and uh, those oversized fingers that you guys have for your sports events, and they're going, yeah, go on, go on. I think that's complete nonsense. I think that right now, Abraham doesn't really care that much about what I'm doing. Just going to go out on a limb here, okay? I think he's probably so enamored with Christ that, that me and my life is not really that big a deal. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced by Scripture that somehow those, you know, and I think funeral services are often the worst places for for emphasizing this understanding. Somehow we have this idea that, you know, oh, well, they've, they've now gone and they're watching us from above. Honestly, if I die tomorrow, I'm, I'm with Jesus. You guys, not, not so interested anymore. You, you might be important right now, but when I'm with him face to face, not such a big deal. And, and this idea that sort of these, these people who've died are kind of sitting around on clouds watching us and going, oh, look, there he is. Oh, we messed up. Oh, now he's doing better. Oh, well done. Here, pass me the popcorn. That's not going on. I really don't believe it. W what we need to do, I think, to understand this is not so much think of the sporting analogy that's about to come, but think of the analogy that's been used throughout chapter 11, which I have mentioned several times, which is the one of there being testimony and witnesses and court-like uh, uh, analogy. And, and what he's saying here is not that these people are cheering us on, not that they're looking at us, but rather that we're looking at them. And that's what he says. He says, um, when he says, let us lay aside every weight, every sin closely, let's run with endurance, the race set before us. And he talks here about looking to Jesus, but he talks about seeing them first. It doesn't clearly come through in the, in the English text, but I think the idea is that we see them and then we look at Jesus. We'll talk more about the looking at Jesus bit in a minute. But we see them. So they are witnesses to us. They testify. Now let, let's, let's just break it down and think about how this works for us, okay? Here you are, and you failed again. You stumbled. You struggled. Here you are, and you feel hope draining away from you. Here you are thinking, well, you know, I kind of failed anyway, so what does it matter if I fail some more? What does it matter if I, you know, I, I, it's inevitable that I'm going to keep messing up, so, you know, I might as well just dive on into it. And, and we have these excuses that we put into our minds and our heads where we, we use our failure as an excuse for more failure. We use our compromise as an excuse for more compromise. And, and the scripture is saying to us, it doesn't have to be that way. And you say, well, you know, I've, I'm always like this. I've always done this. I, I keep struggling here. I keep failing here. And, and, and the scripture says, yeah, but here's exhibit A, Abraham. Look at the compromise in his life. Look how he messed up again and again. Look how God said, no, I'm going to do it this way, Abraham. And Abraham says, no, 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 no. Ishmael, have Ishmael, use Ishmael. And again and again, he did not believe. And then finally, there on Mount Moriah, he goes to sacrifice his son, believing that God would raise that child from the dead to fulfill his promises if need be. He's changed he didn't compromise. At the end, he became a man of mature faith. And so the, the text is saying, here's the proof that God's faithfulness can be worked out through unfaithful people. That you can become a person of faith. That you, who are a person of faith, can mature in your faith. That God can use even you. Look at all this evidence. Abraham, 
compromised and God brought him to a place of no compromise. And as you go through that list and you see these people, Moses committed murder and then Moses is used to lead the people. And there, even in the midst of it, we had Rahab the prostitute. God can use anyone. He simply requires us to trust him. And our faith journey is a journey of trusting him. And that's the cloud of witnesses. Not people watching us, but people that are evidence that God can do great things through even us. It's quite a different perspective, isn't it? And so there is this great cloud of witnesses and they surround us. They're there is evidence that God again and again and again has used sinful people to achieve his purposes. And you are no different. And I am no different. Satan loves to tell us that we're special in two completely different ways. Firstly, he likes to suggest that we're special so the rules don't apply to us, you know? Everybody else has to do this, but not you because you've had it so hard or your circumstances are different or there's this, this you know, excuse, that whatever it is. Somehow the text now doesn't apply to you. You're, you're special. No, you're not. The text applies to us all equally. But the other way he tells us we're special is almost the opposite. He says, oh, you know, I mean, of course, God can use Abraham, but <laughs> you're not exactly Abraham now, are you? You know, you, you, who, who do you think you are? You, you're just some, you know, you know you, he can use those people. And, you know, and obviously the person to your left or the person to your right, they're perfectly decent people. But you, not a chance. You're special. You're one of the worst ones. And sometimes he uses that to us. And, and this text is saying, look at the evidence of Scripture. Look how again and again God takes people and uses them. And all we have to do is trust him and trust his purposes. That's our journey, being faithful to God and trusting him whatever comes along. And therefore, with that in mind, he says, because of this, therefore, the, 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 the witnesses that we've seen in chapter 11, he says, let us do two things. Let us, firstly, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. So in other words, here we're going to do two things. We're going to, we're going to firstly, we're going to put aside... And then secondly, we're going to see in a minute, we're going to run. Okay? Now, before we deal with the specifics of putting aside, let's look at them together. Let us put aside, let us run. Um, it's one of the few times in the pulpit I'm allowed to talk about running, so hallelujah. Um, but I run a lot. And when you run, you don't want to carry too much. Sometimes in the longer runs, you're going out for longer, it's a long day in the summer, you need to take lots of water or food or your phone for an emergency or what have you. I've got these little packs I have sometimes for when I'm running. But you really want to keep it as light as possible because when you're running, you've got to carry it. And that goes for bottles and bags and paraphernalia and it also goes for the stuff that's a little bit more attached to you around your waist. You don't want to have anything that you have to carry. I got one, one of my good friends who I run with a lot. Uh, he's, uh, he goes to the gym a bit, shall we say. And when I run alongside him in the summer, I always feel a little bit of a boy next to a man. And uh, I always mock him, though, and I say, it's all well and good you having the gun show, pal, but you've got to carry up the mountains every time we go. We run, you know. He's got all of his weight. Looks pretty good, I'll give him that. But he's got all of his weight, but he's got to carry it when he runs. And, and the picture being painted here is one of the fact that we, we've got to run. We've, there's, 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 a, there's something that we've got to do that requires effort and it requires energy. And we don't want to make the job any harder than it already is. It would be crazy, you know. It's like, oh, it, it, Anthony, it's race day. You, you've trained for this big event. I know. Why don't, we, why don't we strap on a whole bunch of extra weight that you wouldn't normally have? 
I know, why don't we wear, wear two left shoes rather than a left and a right? Why don't we, you know, why don't we carry five books in each hand while we go, you'd think that would be crazy, no one would do such a thing as that. You wouldn't want to make the job harder. But I think, I think the problem is, is we don't see our lives as being this race. We don't see this as being something important. We don't see it. We, we just kind of plod through. And so we allow ourselves to be weighed down and entangled. And he says here, lay aside. So we're, we're putting aside this stuff so we can run. Lay aside every weight. Everything that weighs you down. Everything that hinders. We're going to talk about sin in a minute. But I think there's the, the implication here that there are things that in and of themselves aren't inherently sinful that somehow, nevertheless, make your journey harder. It's not inherently sinful to, um, uh, to, I don't know, miss church on a particular week. I'm never going to say, oh, you weren't here this week. We know what sort of sinner you are, you know. I'm not, I'm not going to judge you for that, you know, and people have vacations and things come up and people get sick and what have you. But if, if it's not a priority to you, of course that's going to affect your faith. Of course that's going to affect your walk. And it may be that, that each specific time there are justifications and what have you, but... But do we really want to run this race as well as we can? Do we really want to push on? Do we really want to accomplish all we can accomplish? Is the gospel important to us? Is us being faithful important to us? Or are we happy just to, just to get distracted and weighed down? And then specifically then he says, the sin which clings so closely. And, and the ESV doesn't have the word the here, but it is there in the original. It is the sin. And I think that's significant. I think to these people, we know we've been doing this book for a year now, we're very aware that the sin for them is the temptation to go back to old covenant Judaism, to go back to a sacrificial system, to go back to what they knew, what they were raised in, because of the persecution they were facing. And for them, that is the sin. That's the sin that clings on to them and won't let them go. Now, your sin might be very different to their sin, I imagine. No one here rushing to, to kill any animals to uh, sacrifice the blood before the altar in a temple. But there are sins. There are sins that we have that cling to us, that, that, that dig in. When my dog comes out with me running, he'll sometimes come back. Many of you have met my buddy. And he comes back sometimes with these ticks on him. Man, you can't just pull a tick off a dog. You've got to kind of get in and twist and turn and pull it out. Otherwise, half of its head stays in there. They're horrible little creatures. But they have this way of just getting in and sucking the blood out of a creature and, and just hanging on there. And sometimes they're so strong that you kind of feel it. It's just, is that just a lump? Has he just got a bump there or, a, or, or, or something? And then you realize that's actually a, a creature that's attached itself on. And sin's like that. That sometimes with sin, it, it, can, it can so subtly just kind of come in and go on. And then you suddenly realize it's there. And it's really hard to get rid of. And sin clings. Sin is, is, a, is a difficult uh, thing to remove. And he's saying to them, if you want to be people of faith, stop being distracted. Stop having these things that hinder your walk, your race, your faith, and put aside that sin that might appeal, that will cling to you. And then let's press on and let's run. And I think that it's very clear as he, as he makes all of these connections from the last chapter and now coming in and what he's saying here, it's very clear, I think, that we are to perceive ourselves as the Abrahams. 
we're to perceive ourselves as the Moses. I'm not saying that your life is going to be as significant as Abraham's was. I don't think any of us are going to have as much of an impact on society and on the church and on, on, on eternity as Moses will. But we are people who, like them, are having this journey and we are to put aside everything that would hinder it because God has a purpose for us as much as he had a purpose for them. It's so important that we get that, that this is, this is our run that he has prepared for us to do and we've just got to get on and do it and live our lives. This is something that when we, when we went through Ephesians a few years back, we were very clear on, that Ephesians starts off by talking about every spiritual blessing. You've received every spiritual blessing. And when he delineates what those blessings are, he says that you were chosen before the foundation of time. But the Father chose us before the foundation of time. And then when he goes through that chapter 1 and into chapter 2, he concludes that whole section by talking about how we're saved by faith, obviously, and not by works so that no one should boast, but goes on to say that we're saved for works that were prepared for us that we should walk in them. You, you have a journey. You have a journey that God chose you for before the foundation of time. And just like Abraham, just like Moses, just like the others, we've got to learn to walk that race, run that race, with, with a patient endurance, the race that was set before us. You haven't got to run my race. I haven't got to run your race. But there's a, there's a race for us. And they're all different but they're all the same insofar as sin will weigh us down and we've got to just keep pushing on with faith. Trust God. Trust God. Something comes in that we didn't expect. Some tragedy, some difficulty, some problem. Something that we didn't want, something we, we, we can't handle. And we trust God. We trust God. We trust God. We just keep going by faith. And whatever comes on our way, whatever hurdles, whatever problems there are, we just keep on going with patient endurance. People often talk about the, you know, the Christian life in terms of a race, and they say, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Listen, guys, it's not a marathon. A, a marathon's, you know, it's a few hours, you know, it's no big deal. I, I've done these 100-mile races. The Christian life is like a 100-mile race. People say, how do you train for a race that's 100 miles? The answer is you can't any more than you can train to be run over by a truck. It's just going to be utterly miserable, and you just, you're just going to get to that point where you cannot muster the strength to take another step forward. If you, if you ever get a chance to see one of these things from a distance, you should do it. You could go to mile 75 and watch people on benches just sobbing. Just there they are with, with the aid station where they've got nice cups of soup and it's pitch black and they've got to somehow go up another mountain, go on for the next aid station another six miles. But before they can do that, they've got to get off the chair. They've got to step up and they've got to keep going. And you see these people who are normal, nice, smiley, rational people who just are trying to summon the strength to get up and take one more step. That's what the Christian life is like. Right there. There's times in your Christian life where it's not about holding pace or what have you. There's sometimes in your Christian life where you want to just sit down and never get up and take another step. There's sometimes in your Christian life where you say, I had no idea it was going to be this difficult. I had no idea that this was before me. I have no strength left in my legs. How do you expect me to get up? I barely made the last five miles. How can I make the next five, let alone the next 25? How do I do this? Patient endurance. That's how you do it. We have this, this saying in, uh, in ultra running where, you know, you're struggling in the latter stages and you, you say, I'll just get to the next aid station. There'll be more water, there'll be more food, I'll just get to the next aid station. And then when it's a struggle to get to the next aid station, 
Okay, just, just do, I'll just get to the next mile, just the next mile. And then you get to the point where, okay, just next step. You just do what you can in the moment to keep going. That's the definition of patient endurance. Sometimes we look at our lives and we look at what's ahead of us and we're like, I can't do that. The Bible says that tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Or sorry, today has enough worries of its own, so don't worry about tomorrow. T today is what we have to do. This step. Can you be faithful to God now? Today. In this moment. Tomorrow? We'll worry about that tomorrow. But today, right now, can you be faithful to God? With all your trials, with all your struggles, with all your difficulties, with all your history of failure, can you be faithful to God now? That's patient endurance. And then you ask the question again the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and we keep going, and we keep going, and we keep going. Now you say, well, you're not really selling this. <laughs> It sounds pretty miserable. Well, here's the good part when we come to verse 2. So much as we've got all of these others as a witness to us, there's one that we should have our eyes on. Because as I said already, the story of Hebrews 11 is not the story of Abraham and his faithfulness. It's not the story of Moses and his faithfulness. It's the story of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It's the faithfulness of God. It's how God, the sovereign triune God, was sovereign over all the lives of all of these people. And so, when we are running, let us run, run is a command there, the way in which we run is the looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith. Different versions say here different things. Creator and finisher, author, finisher, pioneer is another one I've come across. Um, but the idea is he's at the beginning of our faith and he's the end of our faith. Now, that, again, don't get lost in the familiarity of the text, Okay? What it's saying here is that Jesus is the, uh, the founder, the author, the creator of our faith. We, we, way back in Hebrews chapter 2, we had a similar statement where it talked about uh, Jesus there being, the same word was used, him being the author, the founder of our salvation. Hebrews 2 and verse uh, 10, it is. So Jesus is the one who... who gave us faith. He created our faith. He, he's the one who started this journey. And he, he has this race laid out before us. Now, normally when I do these long running races, you can look at maps beforehand. And sometimes you have to because they can be like long distances and you, you kind of want to have a vague idea. I've done some races where it's compulsory to carry a map with you at all times so you don't get lost. But there is one race that they did, I don't think they do it anymore, that was particularly mentally brutal. And it was a race that they called the piece of string race. Because of the expression, how long is a piece of string? And so you would do the piece of string race, and you would say, okay, off you go this way, this way, and off you go. And they would give you directions to the next aid station. And that's all you knew. And then you got there, and you went to the next day station. And you had no idea how long that race would be. In fact, the race director didn't know either until on the start of the race, he pulled out of a hat at various lengths of the race. It could be anything from 3 miles to 133 miles or something like that. And he would just pull out of the hat and say, OK, this is that. OK, now we know how long you're going. And often it would be on a circuit, and you just keep going, and you keep going. And you did not know when you got to the aid station, whether you were finished or you had to go again. Utterly, mentally brutal. But is that not what our Christian life is like? We have no idea where we're going next, what's around the corner, how much longer we've got to go. 
what, what, what's gonna, what we're going to find in our journey. It's just this complete mystery to us. But Jesus is the one who started us on this journey, and Jesus is the one who will perfect us, mature us. He's the one who took Abraham and said, this is the plan I have for you. The guy who won't believe me, when it comes to Isaac, you're going to be a, have a knife above Isaac. You're going to trust me completely. He sees our journey. He knows what we can do. Be looking ahead in Isaiah, where he talks in Isaiah 40 about uh, how God will bring comfort to the weary. He, he knows us. A bruised reed he will not break. He knows how much further we've got in us. Sometimes we think we're done. We think we can't cope with this or do this or what have you. But we look to Jesus knowing this, and this is the thing that everybody seems to miss in this verse, that he is the one who starts the journey and he's the one who has this race laid out for us and it's going to take us to the end of our journey. So we trust him. We, it's him that we're trusting in. It's not some random series of events in life. It's Jesus. He's the one that says, here's the start of your journey of faith. Off you go. Well, where am I going? Just, just go. But, but how long is it going to go on for? When am I going to learn this? Well, are we dealing with this sin now or that sin? What about this thing? Just go. Wasn't that Abraham's life? Go to a land I will show you. So what land would that be? The one I'm going to show you. But, but, but you know, where's the destination? What, what do I put in the sat-nav? Just go. I'll show you. Is that not the walk of faith? And so Abraham goes, and he goes on that journey, and he, as he goes each step, God is directing his path to teach him, to expose his unfaithfulness, to expose his, his compromise so that God will deal with those things and bring him to a place of maturity. Listen, folks, this is the most encouraging scripture here. That Jesus, he's the author of our faith. He's the founder of our faith. I get that. I don't think he's talking here about, you know, you know the creator of the Christian religion, blah, blah, blah. He's talking about our individual journeys, the race before us, the one set before us. He's talking about our individual journeys, and he's saying that Jesus is the one who started that. Well, we all agree on that. That's not the issue. But we're looking to him because he's also the one that is going to perfect it. He knows where we're going. He knows what's coming up next. He knows why it's coming up next. He knows what he's doing by bringing it up next. He's got it in control. You know, sometimes when we teach children, we teach stuff that's really simple and simplified. And sometimes we lose that simplicity. You know? I can remember at a kid at primary school, as we called it in England, I guess, I don't know where I'll be here, junior school here, just having school assemblies that were still religious in nature in those days, and singing, he's got the whole world in his hands. Half of you are old enough to have that now ringing around your head. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Just repetitive, simple, basic. But boy, how I wish I would have believed that and trusted that and known that in my adult life. How often we forget that he holds the whole universe in his hands. That he is the creator and he is the sustainer. That he is the one who plots the path, charts the, the journey. He knows where he's taking us. He knows where, what, where we need sustenance, when we need our aid stations, when we need to have food and drink, when we need to have a rest, when we need to have a break. He takes us on, he moves us, and he, he has everything to hand. Why? Because he's the founder and perfecter of our faith. He's in control. But you see, and here's the great thing about Hebrews, and this is where he's pointing us back to what we did before chapter 11. Not only is he in control, but he walked the walk as well. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising 
the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now next week we're going to come back to this more when we see him talking in verse 3 about the endurance he had, not growing weary, not growing faint-hearted in your struggle of sin, um, not having yet shed blood. We're coming to all of that. So all of this, this context is, is um, what we're talking about, but we're coming through to it next time in more detail. But see here in verse 2 that what's being done is this, is that Jesus is the one in control of everything. He's in control of our lives, in control of our faith. He's, he's started our journey. He's going to finish our journey. He knows what he's doing. And at the same point, because he's God, that is true. But because he's man, he had his journey too. He ran his race. That's what it means for him to be our high priest that he is there as man representing us before God. He had his own journey. And this was his journey. He endured the cross, despising the shame. The cross of Jesus Christ is suffering that we will never be able to comprehend or imagine. And... The phrase despising the shame I find absolutely fascinating. That this was something that was, was horrendous for him. This was something that was not worthy of him. He deserved nothing. It was poured upon him. And yet he endured it. And look at the phrase here before. For the joy of that was set before him. And what's that joy? Where is that? He despised the shame. He despised the cross. But now look, he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He went through the cross knowing that he was going to get to the right hand of God knowing what was going to be accomplished through the cross, knowing that that cross was what founds the faith, perfects the faith. He went through all of that for that joy of that exaltation that comes. So much here is, uh, is familiar with uh, he, uh, Philippians 2 and that whole section where it talks about Christ humbling himself and that because he humbled himself, therefore God super exalted him. Because he humbled himself at the cross, therefore God lifted him up. And this for us and our journey is this. This is what's being painted here. Not only is Jesus in control of your lives and all things, but whatever he's asking you to go through is less that he went through. And he went through it knowing the joy that was on the other side. This has come up again and again. This has been, the, this has been the, one of the key things in all of Hebrews 11. Not just their journeys, but they did it because they believed in the promised land. They believed in what was to come. They believed in the resurrection. They believed that God would ultimately make things good and right. Because they trusted God for their future, they lived for him in the present. Jesus he saw the future, he saw the joy, he saw the rejoicing, and so he endured the cross. And now is seated at the right hand of the Father. No, you don't know the next step. You don't know what trials await. You don't know what's going to happen this year, next year, next week. You don't know what... Um, if, I, if I get my baseball terminology correct, next, what curveball is going to be thrown at you. You've got no idea. But we do know about the rewards. He's talked about them again and again. We do know that faithfulness is rewarded. We do know there is joy before us. We do know that there is going to be a time when we see him face to face and everything will make sense. And every compromise that we made, every time we said, well, I don't think that verse applies to me in this situation, or God doesn't expect that of me, every time we made an excuse, every time we let that sin just, just cling on to us, every time we didn't put aside the things, we'll look back and we'll say, 
I could have just trusted him. And every time we did trust him, we'll be so grateful we did. We'll be rewarded. Rewards, genuine, bona fide rewards. And there is no depth deeper than the shame of the cross. And there's no place greater than seated at the right hand of the Father. We won't go as low, and we won't be raised as high. But are we prepared to go low? Are we prepared to be humbled? Are we prepared to be faithful? This is, I think it's, it's, it's a good and natural that we go from Hebrews to 1 Peter when we, uh, we get there in a, in a month or two, July. I'm not planning on a break in between. Um, I'm not planning on a break in between the books because 1 Peter is dealing with people who are suffering in terrible persecution. And so many of these themes we've been dealing with, we're going to run straight in with them into 1 Peter while it's fresh in our minds. Because these, these people, remember, they are threatened. Their, their livelihoods, their lives in many cases, it's all threatened. They're being persecuted from all sides and all corners. And God was saying, just trust me. Just trust me. Just trust me. And they saw their security in the temple, in, in, the, in, the, in the, the faith of their fathers as they saw it. Hebrews is saying that's not the faith of your fathers. The faith of your fathers is not the sacrificial system. The faith of your fathers is not the temple. The faith of your fathers is trusting God. And when God said make the sacrifices, you had to make the sacrifices. That's trust in God. When God says don't make them anymore because you have one sacrifice for all people for all time, then you don't make them anymore. You trust him. When God says you go to the temple, then you trust him and you go to the temple. When God says you now are the temple, you trust him and you believe that. And whatever we're facing, there is always a reason. There's always a reason not to trust. And it's going to seem so stupid retrospectively. It's just going to seem ridiculous. It's going to seem as ridiculous looking back on our lives as when we look back on the lives of these people. Oh, Abraham, why would you do that? Why on earth would you go and take Hagar? I mean, why would you? God said he's going to give you a son. Do you, do you think if you don't suddenly intervene, like put on your cape and I'm super Abraham, I'm going to intervene and do what God, God couldn't do this without me. Quickly, let me come up with plan B because God's dropped the ball. Let, it's just so stupid. And we look at it and we're like, Abraham, why? Just trust God. And yet, don't we do the same thing every single day? And we are just as stupid. It's just as pointless, and it makes so little sense. But we're, we're in the story rather than watching it. So these are our witnesses. This is the evidence. This is the testimony to us to just keep on trusting God. And as we keep on pressing through and pressing through, something else comes, something else we didn't expect, something else we don't want, something that brings shame, something that we despise, something that we can't handle, and we trust God because we say, Jesus, I'm trusting you. You put me on this journey, you saved me, you have a plan for me in the end, I'm trusting you. It's just so simple. And yet, in the midst of our walk, it can be so hard, so complicated. All these excuses and all of these reasons. So let us make a decision in our hearts today. Let us remember that God has done this once or twice before. That we are we come in a long line of servants of God. Whatever it is that distracts us, whatever it is that hinders us, whatever it is that prevents us, 
whatever sin it is that we particularly struggle with. Just let's put it aside. And let's commit in our hearts to push on. And when there's a seemingly a reason not to trust him, let's trust him. And keep doing what's right. When, when scripture tells us to do something, let's do it. When it tells us not to do something, let's not do it. Let's not let our circumstances impact our understanding of Scripture. Let's not let a passage that makes perfect sense in the cold light of day suddenly be dubious and doubtful because something's happened or our circumstances or, or what have you. Let's trust him. And let's remember that he endured the cross and he now seats at the right hand of the Father. And let us remember on our journey that our God is faithful and he'll reward us for every unseen act of faith, every unseen moment of trust. And let's have that joy before us as we look to Christ and let's live uncompromising lives for his glory. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that you would, Lord, that you would enable us. And Lord, even saying that, I, I feel convicted. Because you have enabled us. You've given us your Holy Spirit that we might be able to put aside and to run. Whatever you've convicted us of this day, Lord, may we put those things aside. May we run the race you have set before us. Whatever comes to distract us, to hinder us, to make the journey more difficult, more testing, may our eyes be on Christ. May we look to him, may we trust him, and may we see that his example is the greatest witness of all. May we know that you reward us, and may we trust you. You have the whole world in your hands. May we trust you. You have our life in your hands. May we trust you. You see the beginning and the end. May we trust you. Mature us by faith, we pray, Lord. And may you be glorified as we trust in you that your faithfulness might be apparent to all. Amen.